We're going to study the book of Philippians. Uh, it's a book that uh, has had a big part in my life and my ministry. Uh, I had a lot of time to uh, look at Philippians from a different viewpoint. Uh, always it was pastoring before and, and uh, the difference in uh, delivery and difference in the uh, things that are found there but it's still the truth and we can use it and it's a it's a book that's um, the book, Church of Philippi was organized on Paul's second missionary journey and it to me I, I like the book of Philippians because it was an ideal way in which the work started it uh, Paul and Silas came in to got a vision let's go there and look at that 16th chapter of the book of Acts now we're going to be in Philippians but I want to give you a little bit of history about what's going to be uh, uh, transpiring here in uh, the blessings of which are innumerable uh, for our, us because it deals with joy. And in the ministry, uh, you have to do things that uh, sometimes that are not always uh, uh, joyful, but you have to maintain the reality that you have uh, to realize who and what you're doing in the midst uh, with preaching the truth of God's word to God's people. 16th chapter of the book of Acts, we're gonna look at the uh, organization uh, or the work, how it came into existence. Uh, this all started with the, someone to give them a vision of come over to Macedonia and preach to them. And uh, we're gonna pick it up in verse, uh, around verse 12 of the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. Uh, in reading at that point. And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of the part of Macedonia, and a colony, and we were in that city uh, uh, abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath, we went out uh, of the city uh, to the uh, riverside. I'll get my glasses on. I've got, my glasses are coming. I've had cataract surgery and now getting around to where I can come and, and get some glasses. He says, and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city by the riverside where prayers was, uh, was uh, went to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women uh, which uh, resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us whose heart, uh, heart the Lord opened. And it's beautiful the way that, uh, they, that this is described by Paul. And, he, and that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, so salvation came to her whole household they were all saved she besought us and saying if ye have judged me to be faithful to the lord come unto my house abide there and she constrained us or she enticed them to do that and it came to pass as we went uh, to prayer a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us which brought her masters uh much gain by soothsaying. Uh, here's a young lady, demon possessed. And the same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which uh, show unto us the way of salvation. And in this uh, she made day, uh, many days, she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said unto the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Now, this 
This here is uh, an exorcist, we would say, in day and time now. And by the way, this does work. You have to call uh, those out. Um, uh, the demons are with them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's some that won't come out with that yet, the prayer and fasting. And that's another subject. But uh, uh, this works. Uh, I, When I was in school, a uh, young preacher, missionary, and I went out to this place where this 10-year-old uh young man was uh, had made a false profession in the church and he was uh, now demon possessed and uh, he was uh, speaking uh, in a growling form with all these here uh, uh, evil connotations coming out and he had tremendous strength uh, there was probably four preachers dealing with um, with him, uh, and this is the procedure that they used here, and this is where they went to get that. And um, the the whole thing was uh, scary. Let's put it like this: uh, you know, here I was, a young preacher, and I'd not seen anything like this before. I've heard about it. But uh, you think that's something that uh, that's not uh, an everyday thing, which it's not. And when anyway, they uh, would. Uh, this ten-year-old boy was throwing these four preachers around, approximately uh, two hundred pounds or whatever, and uh, had the great strength. And the only way they could stop him from doing that is to throw him on the couch and put the Bible across his chest and hold him down. And when they would take that off of him, um, later on he ripped his clothes off because that's one of the things that the demon possession does is it pulls the nakedness out of an individual. And on that young boy's chest was an imprint where the Bible was. Now, this sounds like fantasy, <laughs> and I, if you would have told me this, I would have probably felt the same way. But anyway, here it is. Paul goes in uh, with Silas, and they're going to uh, uh, take the gospel to uh, uh, to Lydia, the seller of purple of Thyatira. And then the demon-possessed uh, young lady comes, and uh, it, it comes out of her, and... Uh, Let's pick it back up there again. And when, when her master saw that the hope of the their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace, into the rulers, and brought them to uh, the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city uh, and teach customs which are uh, not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe uh, being Romans. And then the multitude rose up, to see, this is the 16th chapter, verse 22, and the multitude rose up to gather against them, and the magistrate ran off their clothes and commanded uh, to beat them. And when they had uh, uh, laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Now, this is a serious situation. The jailer was going to be called into a position that if these prisoners would get away, uh, then he would be uh, held responsible and put to death. He, said, he says, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison. And this wasn't air conditioned. It wasn't all these here things that you have the day where they have a uh, library and computers and all those things. This was probably uh, damp. It was probably running with rodents and spiders and uh, uh, wet and uh, damp and all those different things. And he says, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison 
were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's hands were loosed. Now, this is a miracle that took place and, and it happened just like it said it did. And, uh, the, and the keeper of the prison, awaking out of sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been a fled or they escaped. And Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm for we are all here. Then he called for a, a light and sprang in and came trembling. This is uh, the jailer, uh, fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, uh, this is a ready-made, uh, <coughs> this is a ready-made uh, witness that came and was seeking the Lord uh, and the jailer was because of the mercy that was, I think, bestowed uh, towards him. <coughs> he said, and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spoke unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour <coughs> of the night and wore their stripes and were baptized he and all his uh, his straight way so the flipping jailer and his whole house were saved and were baptized and when he had <clears throat> brought them into his house he uh, set meat before them and and uh, rejoiced believing in god and all uh, with all his house and when it was uh, was day <clears throat> magistrate sent the servant saying let those men go and the keeper of the prison told this saying to paul the magistrates have set sent to let you go now therefore depart and go in peace and paul uh, said unto them they have beaten us openly uncondemned uh, being Romans and have cast us into prison and now do they trust us at, thrust us out privately uh, nay verily but let them come themselves and fetch us out what they was doing <laughs> they had uh, made a mistake and because they were Romans they couldn't uh, uh, they couldn't chastise them the way they did and throw them in jail so they were trying to smooth it over it must have been Democrats or something there. So it was anyway, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans and they came and besought them and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city. And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had set the brethren, they comforted them and departed. So we find here uh, Paul and Silas going in and these were the converse these were the first members now let's go over to Philippians chapter 1 and uh, we're going to now deal with the uh, Paul's in prison uh, at, at this time when he wrote the letters uh, and that was around 60 to 64 uh, they say um, uh, AD and in the, in the, we find here that Paul's going to give uh, a what I call a beautiful love letter to a church that uh, has touched his heart, and uh, and uh, he gives here and he says in Paul and Timothy verse one, he says here that uh, the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus were to our Philippi. The bishops are overseers and deacons are servants. He says, grace be unto you, peace be uh, from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I thank my God in every remembrance of you. You know, <clears throat> what it is, he's gonna deal in chapter one with circumstances. Paul was in prison at this time uh, and uh, when he wrote the letter and, and he created this 
uh, remembrance. He remembered exactly uh, the salvation experiences, the thing that was dealt with with the uh, de demon-possessed individual and those type of things there, and it was a blessing. But he's going to give us a key and how that we can deal with circumstances in our life. And because circumstances are always trying to interfere with the, the norm of everything in our life, and the Lord has designed every circumstance uh, to, uh, and Paul's going to give us the key to what he had learned out of this uh, prison and all this. You would think he'd be complaining, and probably if, if it would have been me, I would have been complaining too. But uh, we find here, and he deals in verse 4 with the first thing that is a very important factor. He says, uh, always in every prayer of mine for you all requesting with joy verse 5 for your fellowship of the gospel so he's he, he is um, remembering them and he, he took the church to heart he was remembering everything about them and you could see the love coming out but he says uh, they request with joy he says that the fellowship of the gospel from this day until now and of course, the importance of this is that uh, you're going to see that the key for everything that God puts in our lives is for our betterment in whatever it is. In this case, it was the church of Philippi, uh, and uh, he uh, was uh, writing to them to encourage them that uh, they needed to realize that uh, God had... Uh, he wanted them to realize that he, they were having uh, these things come upon them uh, for the fellow, because of the fellowship of the gospel. And of course, that's important because uh, the book of Philip, uh, Philippians is a book that deals with uh, joy and rejoicing on a, a great scale. And uh, we want to look at those different areas in verse 4 we already seen that there that uh, it was rejoicing in prayer he says always in every prayer of mine for uh, you all making requests with joy and of course um, uh, when Paul was praying for them back there uh, he had them in his heart and his mind and uh, and he wanted to uh, uh, he was rejoicing when he was bringing the the, the, the no doubt that they're going to Lydia's house and staying with them and the fellowship that they had and of course the word fellowship means to have in common it's not a, a fellowship meal or a piece of cake or a cup of coffee it is fellowship because of the salvation experience that each of us have from the Lord that we can rejoice in that uh, in circumstances in any case. And he goes on and says there's not only was he rejoicing in the prayers, uh, but also in the gospel. It's interesting here in the original translation over to the, from the Greek to the English, it deals with the truth. And coupled with uh, the gospel, look in verse 18 here. In uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 18, he says, what then, withstanding every way, whether in presence or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, and you, and will rejoice. Uh, and of course, the importance of this, uh, he just, uh, in the preceding verse, in verse 17, said about the defense of the gospel. The gospel is, uh, is the truth that he's uh, rejoicing in here, and he's uh, wanting them to realize that that is the basis for the fellowship that they have. And it's n not anything other than that um, uh, God has chosen and dealt with us and brought us from the darkness into the light to this good news that Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and rose again the third day. And according to the scriptures, uh, that we have the ability to fellowship. Now, uh, 
if we don't have Christ as our personal Savior, the uh, fellowship it turns to a, a, basically a friendship type thing. Uh, and it's not uh, as deep and meaningful as the fellowship of this gospel that he talked about in verse uh, 5 there. For your fellowship in the gospel, which is the first day in the now. In other words, he's talking about from the time that you were saved. And that's the most exciting time, by the way, uh, you have in, in your life. When the Lord saves you, you can't keep your mouth shut of telling others. You can't get enough of studying God's word. You can't get enough of praising him. You can't get enough singing and rejoicing in the Lord uh, because it is. And he's going back to that point uh, in, the, in this first section here in this. Now, uh, also there's a rejoicing. Go to chapter 2 and verse 1 and 2. There's a, a fellowship here. Uh, with uh, with uh, Christ-like fellow Christians. He says here, and there be therefore any consolation in Christ or any comfort uh, of love. And again, this is always, uh, the love has to be a center of, of the salvation experience because it wasn't that we loved him, uh, but uh, he loved us first and extended that through the preaching of the gospel uh, to convict us of our sins be, and show us that he went to Calvary to make that sin payment that we, you and I can rejoice and have joy in our hearts. He goes on and says, if any man, if any spirit of the uh, fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels of mercy. So we find here that the fellowship is uh, generated out of the fruit of the spirit that's been placed within us. And again, the uh, joy and uh, love uh, and, and we're studying that up at the up at the uh, apartments there, and and uh, and this love is whenever God deals with man, it's a it's a the agape love, and when many times if we don't extend it back uh, in that same uh, agape love, uh, which is a love that is uh, is. Uh, all surrounding and all purposely able to bring about a uh, true fellowship with him. And he goes on uh, in verse two there, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like mine, having the same love, being in one accord and of one mind. See, love is the, uh, is the fiber glue that puts that fruit of the spirit into full force in a child of God's life. And the love is not contingent upon anything other than the uh, grace of God that's been extended through us through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, these things are such a blessing for us. So Paul brings this forth in Christian fellowship. If Christian fellowship is not centered around uh, those things that uh, that God has done in us and become a part of our lifestyle, our conversation, and our caring for one another. And if you want to really get into uh, finding out uh, about this, when you go, just go into the Word of God and look at one another's up. You pray for one another. You love one another. You, you. Uh, there's so many avenues of uh, what love affects and everything. And that, and now let's go on to verse 17 of the second chapter, excuse me, uh, verse 17. And uh, we'll see here that uh, there's a willingness to sacrifice for the cause. The, the uh, verse 17 and 18, he says here, yea, and I, if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith. In other words, Paul was so sure and steadfast about the church that Philippi says, I joy and rejoice with you all. In other words, if I'm going to sacrifice and, and, and be in prison here and they take my life, it's gonna be worth it all because as he remembers them, uh, he uh, rejoices 
And then he says, in your all. He said, for the same cause also do you joy and rejoice with me. See, there's a commonness here, and that's what that fellowship's all about. Uh, it is something that is, uh, is uh, a love that is uh, in, uh, in, through the gospel, and of course what the gospel has freely given to us by the grace of God in our salvation experience. He wants us to present our bodies a living sacrifice unto God, and that's, that's where it's at. Uh, uh, if you serve the Lord, you're gonna have to realize that if you're not willing to sacrifice all, uh, you'll never have the joy of the Lord in your heart because uh, Jesus Christ is our example and he has done that to be our example. Third chapter, verse one, he talks here about rejoicing in the Lord. See, you're not rejoicing in anything that you are, it's you're rejoicing in the Lord. He says, finally, uh, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. And to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is, uh, it is safe. And again, he, he's uh, admonishing them to rejoice in the Lord. And you know, uh, what that word Lord means master. You can't rejoice if you're double-minded. The double-minded man, James says in chapter two, verse eight, is unstable in all his ways. And that's talking about women and men. But uh, mankind, uh, we uh, rejoice in the Lord in uh, those things. And he goes on with this rejoicing in the fourth chapter, verse 10. Uh, he is uh, bringing us out of, trying to establish the fact that he wants us to have the joy and rejoicing is expressing that uh, joy uh, to the Lord, to the fellowship of one another, uh, willing to sacrifice. And of course, the uh, source of that is coming out of the gospel. And now he says here, uh, rejoicing in the loving care of the church. See, the church is, uh, is, uh, is products of the grace of God and the indwelling spirit of God. And as fruit of the spirit are there and the love that we have for one another can not be put in words, it's all in action and responses towards one another. Look in verse 10 here of the fourth chapter. He says, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me have flourished again wherein ye were uh, also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. We find here that the church at uh, uh, Philippi had sent offerings to Paul, and they had not only just talked about loving him, but they, they give uh, gifts of uh, loving. And he says in one, I think in one place here, that the only church that communicated with him were gave him love offerings was the church of Philippi. So we find here this verb of rejoicing uh, is a uh, ongoing aspect that covers every area of the outreach of the church, the individuals of the church, the uh, uh, reason that they have come forth uh, to, from the gospel that was preached unto them. And again, uh, I wanna stop here and this is the true gospel, not the gospel that's being presented by religion today that uh, has a Lord only in the grave uh, for a shorter time and a resurrection uh, in a day and a half instead of three days and three nights. When you change the truth into a different, something different, you change it into a lie. And the effects of the false gospel, and, and that's ironic because uh, in uh, Galatians, they... I had another gospel come in, the gospel of, uh, of uh, legalistic gospel that was uh, uh, grace plus the law, or grace plus works and that, that type of thing. And again, a lot of the churches, that's exactly what, what is going on today. They're dumbing down and neutralizing the great grace that saved us and brought us from the darkness into the light and the quickening power of the Holy Spirit. Now, in the book of Philippians, Jesus Christ is the central uh, 
central character of that. Even though uh, there is the uh, gospel, and of course uh, we're looking at the circumstances uh, that he's trying to give us encouragement that we have joy in spite of circumstances because we have the attitude of for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Look at verse chapter one and verse 21. Now this is gonna to have to be a permutation of your life because when it comes down to it, you're gonna to have to choose between uh, what, obeying the Lord or obeying your flesh or obeying something other than uh, Jesus Christ and what the scriptures are telling us. He says in verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And that's a, that's a, a questionable thing. You know, there's times in your life and uh, you may, uh, Paul had to go through this and Paul's a, a prime example of that. Uh, he, uh, they tried to kill him. They tried to stone him. They tried to get, um, do everything in the world to him because he was, uh, in fact, that's why he went into the jail there, was cast into jail there because of uh, his stand for the truth of God's word. And of course, the importance of this uh, is that uh, Paul had a single mind. See, when we, when we realize that we belong to God, there's no options here. He's not going to uh, be a part of your life halfway. When he saved you, he bought you. He bought all of you. And he wants us to have a single mind and for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Well, my voice is get going fast, so we'll stop there and come back in and get maybe more into it next week here. So, but. Yeah.